It's The World This Week, seven days, four Paris based correspondents, one hour. The World This Week, in partnership with The Daily Beast, foreign editor Christopher Dickey is with us. How are you, sir? Good. Glad to be here, as always. Glad, glad to have you. Uh, glad to have as well with us uh, Claude Guibal, senior correspondent for flagship French public radio station France Inter. Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Claire Byrne, France correspondent for the French news agency AFP. Thank you. And uh, journalist Pierre Aski, president of Reporters Without Borders. Welcome Hello. back. Thank Hello. you. The uh, World This Week on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag World This Week. Kurdish-led Syria militias always said it. If they'd taken the stadium in Raqqa, then you could say the headquarters of the so-called caliphate had fallen. It's there this week that ISIS uh, had uh, had to leave and it was declared. ISIS used to stage rallies and jail prisoners in that stadium. Three years on, Raqqa has been taken, uh, but the fighting's not over yet. And there's, of course, what to do with the foreign nationals that are caught. At displaced camps like this one, there are citizens of Raqqa eagerly awaiting the day when landmines have been cleared and they can go home and rebuild. But there are also the wives and children of uh, foreign fighters. Claude Guibal, uh, one of your correspondents, uh, reported earlier this week that uh, he stumbled upon five-year-old kids uh, speaking French. In refugee camps in northern Raqqa, yeah. Yeah, what Omar Oman said, that actually he met these kids and their mothers, and these women, I mean, according to what uh, Omar Oman said, uh, this woman said, we are, we are trapped here, we have no more passports, we want to go home, we want to go back to France. Um, we made a mistake, so let's take us back to our country. That's we, what. we made a mistake, uh, is, is what they said. Christopher Dickey, your, your reaction to that, what, what do you do with the wives and children here in this case? Well, I think it's going to be very difficult to decide what to do. I mean, the instant thing is to sympathize with them, to say that they were taken there by force by their husbands, or they went there, they were completely deluded. But I'm not convinced that that's the case with a lot of them. I think a lot of the women were just as ideological as the men were. They may not have been in, involved in combat as much. They may not have been beheading prisoners. But they were truly complicit uh, with the Islamic State. We had a very interesting piece uh, about a captured laptop uh, that was found that had belonged to a Moroccan-Belgian woman, a, a Belgian woman. Uh, and it looked at, we analyzed the laptop and looked at what she was looking at over the course of several weeks and months over the summer. And there was no indication that she was looking to reject the Islamic State at all. It's true that she was looking at some pornography. She was looking at some movies, Pirates of the Caribbean. She seemed to think that was a great movie, downloaded it. But she was not rejecting the ideology. And it was only in the very last days that she, um, she started Googling or using a search engine to find out what happened to ISIS prisoners, women who were ISIS prisoners, uh, or ISIS uh, partisans who turned themselves in. So I think there's going to be a lot of last-minute conversions to we just want to go home. Mm. But I'm not sure that governments in, uh, in Belgium or France or Europe are going to want those people to come home. What do they do, uh, Pierre Aski? I think you, you're going to have a request, a demand for toughness from public opinion because uh, I don't think people will be ready to run any risk. And, you, you know, and, and it's understandable uh, following everything that has happened for the past uh, three years in France. Uh, and we've just had the, the trial of the, the brother of Mohamed Merah, one of the early uh, terrorists, and, and this has revived a lot of uh, pain and and, uh, and difficult memories. And I think people will... Yeah, we're, we're, if I, in that trial, we're discovering not just him, but a whole family that's yes, radicalized. Yes, yes, and that's, that, I think, will not plead for clemency uh, in, in the case of, of these uh, families who are have been trapped in, in Raqqa, whether from their own choice or that proved fatal or... Uh, from being, you know, uh, induced by fake, uh, uh, um, by lies. But the, the thing is, you'll have to find a solution for them because, uh, okay, you, you send them to prison and so what? You know, do you solve any of the problems? So we'll have to find smart solutions, uh, human 
solutions that deal both with the demands of public opinion and with a very unique situation. And, and children that could be traumatized, well, for their whole lives. Yes, indeed. Um, and there's every sign that the French government, as uh, Pierre was saying, is going to take quite a you know, an inclement stance on this. Um, the Defence Minister, Florence Parly, has already said mm. that yeah. she would envisage the return of the children, but not the mothers, so that the mothers could decide to send their children back to stay with family, um, basically have to give up their children, or um, stay and be tried in Iraq, Syria, um, and keep their children with them. So these, uh, these women will face a, a, tough, a tough choice. The, the minister also said uh, that she would not be too sad if the French who are uh, with the Islamic State died in, in Raqqa or in yeah, we've, other we've places. Yeah, we've already heard these tales of returning, we've already uh, heard which is something that you, you would imagine she can think but say publicly, well, that it's was very surprising. Different. Yeah, because we've heard these tales of summary executions, as reported, for instance, by the Wall Street Journal that have taken place in Iraq uh, during the capture of Mosul. Where oh, I think there's no question that there were summary executions. The question, the big question, I think, for the French and some of the Europeans who've had troops on the ground in this theater is whether there were special operations forces who were actually hunting the nationals of these countries. This has been a persistent rumor. I can't confirm it, but it's worth pondering that there were special operations forces hunting for French jihadists uh, who would die in combat or however, rather than face the problem of bringing them back. Because there's another, there's an ancillary thing here. If they are brought back, if they are put in jail, how long do they stay in jail? Mm. And they don't stay in jail that long in this country. So you have somebody that is fighting in Raqqa, mm. survives, comes back to France, is put in jail for five years, 10 years. Mm. And then what? And there's also the problem of radicalization in prisons. So France is not very keen to have its prisons mm. uh, filled to overflowing with returning jihadists or well, the their wives. The prestige of being combatants, by the way, yes. in, in a, the prison. Mm. Ex entirely. And then would be in a position possibly to radicalize others. And well, we know certainly. that the perpetrators of the uh, Charlie Hebdo attacks and of the, the attack in the Jewish supermarket, that they met their uh, gurus, if you like, in, in French prisons. And I, I think it's also, since we were talking about the women the, in, in the initial question, I think it's important to understand that there are several cases where you've seen men who were jihadists, but when you look closely at the family environment and the environment they were in, there is some woman, sometimes a sister, sometimes a wife, sometimes a sister-in-law, sometimes a mother, who was, in fact, pushing them and saying, are you man enough to be a martyr? I mean, this is... Mm. But it's true that there were young uh, girls, you know, teenagers, who went to, to Syria, were given a husband there, and, and uh, later had children, and, and who were really too young to have been um, certainly ideologically convinced by anything. And what do you do with them? You know, this is really a, a hard, uh, hard topic for, yeah, the, for the, the receding of ISIS, also uh, changing uh, alliances on in, in both Syria and Iraq. While Kurdish-led forces were celebrating in Raqqa, there are Iraqi counterparts retreating. This Friday, there was an exchange of fire in the town of Altun Kupri as the last Peshmergas retreated out of Kirkuk province. Last month's elation after a non-binding independence referendum in Iraqi Kurdistan giving way to recrimination between Kurds as their forces were quickly flushed out of that ethnically mixed, oil-rich uh, province. Claude Guibal, uh, it's, uh, the, the fighting's not yet over against ISIS, and already uh, we're seeing friends turn foes. Or, or I wouldn't call them friends, but certainly allies turn foes. American back to lies. Um, fighting American back to lies with American supplied weapons. Yeah, that's what we are actually uh, looking at. It's not a surprise. It is not a surprise. We knew it was going to happen. Uh, the problem was the narrative of all that, but we know that what's going to happen next, and that might what happen might happen next in Raqqa as well, because you do have the problem of governance now. Who's going to rule these areas? Raqqa, Kirkuk, Mosul. The day after was the main question since the beginning of this war, and it has been, it's a question that has not found any answer.
Well, different answers in different places. Mm. I mean, we see Kobani, if you remember, in, mm. in 2014, 2015, long protracted fight for Kobani, all the airstrikes by the Americans, the YPG affiliated with the PKK in Turkey, was they were the strongest fighters. They fought on the ground in Kobani, and they took Kobani, but Kobani is essentially empty, uh, and the YPG runs it. And who, to the extent that people have moved back into it, who handles the administration of Kobani? pays the salaries and stuff, mm -hmm. the government of Syria. I think mm -hmm. you'll see something very similar in Raqqa. The but, let me just but, a, yeah, a question about the, the president of Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, Masoud Barzani. His term expired two years ago. Again, on the night of September 24th, there was elation after this independence referendum. And now, uh, boy, the, public opinion there seems to have changed. N not only that, but you have the, the root of, of the next war between uh, the two uh, big uh, opposing parties of Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. You have uh, because Barzani is the the uh, is one of the big historical families uh, running uh, Kurdistan. But there's another family, the Talabani. Uh, the elder Talabani just died. He was uh, actually the federal president of Iran, Iraq for some time. And his son uh, has been involved in the recapture of uh, Kirkuk because he allied with the Baghdad forces against Barzani. So you have uh, uh, root elements of, of, of a Kurdish civil war, which could really erupt, and and which has happened before. Yes, of course, they they, they had been the fighting 1990s. in the nineties. Yes, yeah. but the 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 war against ISIS is not really finished. That that the next wars it's are are, are showing signs. They're not necessarily coming, but at least the potential for new conflicts on borders, on control of oil in Kirkuk, on uh, uh, minorities. You know, I I Iraq has a big problem of uh, uh, a Shiite majority. We had these Shiite ma militias uh, being involved in atrocities in the recapture of uh, Mosul. I mean, there are so many uh, small, local, uh, but major elements of, of yeah. new conflicts. And staging an independence referendum uh, doesn't always go the way you wish. <laughs> Case in point, <laughs> Catalonia, deadline day has come and gone there, but regional president Carles Puigdemont still refusing to renounce the right to declare independence. He hasn't done so. It's nonetheless staging, setting the stage for the government in Madrid with the backing of the socialist opposition to formally launch direct rule at a special cabinet meeting to be held Saturday, invoking the never-before-used Article 155 of the Constitution. We have tried by all means to not arrive at a difficult situation, but you will understand that it is very hard for a country and a government of the European Union when the law is broken. The rule of law is broken. And the referendum was held without any kind of guarantees. You will understand that we have reached a critical point. Rule of law was broken, he says, uh, but we saw on October 1st when the Spanish police uh, used a heavy hand to break up voting, public opinion worldwide turned against Madrid. Is he again going to fall into the trap of uh, having public opinion turn against him, even if he does have the law on his side, if, for instance, he dissolves the regional parliament? Um that's that's the, the the real the crux issue for uh, for Rajoy. Um, those images from the referendum certainly um, did uh, create some sympathy internationally for the Catalans that I don't uh, suspect was there before. So when people saw uh, the Guardia Nacional going in there, um, seizing ballot boxes, yanking voters by the hair, it created a, um, a, a certain sympathy for the Catalans. I think that in the, is it two weeks now since, uh, the Madrid government has sort of uh, regained the upper hand in PR terms um, by sort of calling uh, the Catalans bluff on their sort of so-called declaration of independence the other day. Um, and then also, uh, because we saw this massive pro-unity rally in Catalonia uh, as well uh, just uh, 10 days ago. Um, so it kind of swung back to Madrid. However, that could change if they go in there hard um, by, for example, dissolving uh, the Catalan police force and also, uh, as they're threatening to do, dissolve government, uh, call elections that might be rejected uh, by the independence, uh, pro-independence camp. The pro-independence camp, which is playing up, of course, the arrest and possible charging on sedition of uh, the, the what they call the two Geordies, these two leaders of these grassroots movements. Again, 
arrests, uh, arresting Carlos Puigdemont, a move like that, would that, again, f move towards... Uh, uh, perhaps uh, playing into the hands of the separatists. It certainly does uh, feel that arresting Carlos Puigdemont would be, if we're already at the nuclear option, that might be the H-bomb. So um, I think that they would think long and hard before doing that. Um, I, I think they would, but I'm not sure how much Puigdemont really has support, particularly mm -hmm. in Barcelona. His, his support is r essentially rural support. He was the mayor of uh, Girona. He was, he's from a tiny little town called Amer, uh, where everybody always speaks Catalan, and they've basically all been independent for a long time. But whether cosmopolitan Barcelona is really behind Puigdemont, I'm not sure that that's true. I think that we saw how Rajoy can screw things up with the video of the police beating people at the, at the ballot boxes. Uh, but I think arresting Puigdemont... I'm not sure that would be the nuclear option here. I think people, he didn't have a very strong government coming in. He governs now with the cooperation of a radical, an anarchist party, the CUP, which is the smallest party in the parliament. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that he would have that much support. On, on the hashtag uh, world this week, Brexit and Catalonia referenda prove uh, that it does not work. Uh, ref referendums don't work for complicated questions. The B side is never shown. Uh, Claude Guibal, your thoughts now, because the, at, at this point in time, neither side is, is blinking. Um, the thing is, as far as I'm concerned, the feeling I have is that they are playing both, I mean, Puigdemont and uh, Rajoy, their own political survival. Um, I'm not sure that Puigdemont has gained so much support. I mean, he's been trying to meet leaders abroad in Europe, even in the United States, and it was not backed by anyone because it's hard to, to be backed. I think he might be playing a risky gamble, actually, in provoking uh, Madrid, you know. Maybe it's a good bet for him to call for, you know, if uh, Article 155 is triggered, because it will... It might be a, a, a very strong sign to the other um, um, regions of Spain, you know, if this article is triggered, what will happen in Andalusia and everything for the next elections? You know, it's a very, it's a very risky gamble, but uh, he has no choice. Puigdemont has no choice. He cannot go backward. Can't go backwards. Uh, you're saying, of course, we'll see what happens uh, when the Spanish cabinet meets. Stay with us. There's more to come here in the world this week, including the ever tightening grip on power by China's leader. The 51 percent presented by Annette Young. A program about women who are reshaping our world. We meet those who seek equality, be it in the boardroom or at the village well. The 51% brings you stories from across the globe about the women who are challenging the way we think. The 51% on France 24 and France24.com. Revisited, presented by Stuart Norville. In 1941, Hitler decides to invade Russia. In Leningrad, the resistance opposes the German army. The siege lasts 900 days. <laughs> Nearly 80 years later, the city has recovered its historic name of St. Petersburg. And on its outskirts, volunteers still search to find unburied soldiers. Today, this dark page in history has not been forgotten. Survivors tell their stories, and young children still learn about the siege of Leningrad. Revisited on France 24 and France24.com. Welcome back. Before we resume The World This Week, some of the stories we're following for you in the newsroom. Another bloody Friday in Afghanistan, capped by the attack on a Shiite mosque in the capital during Friday prayers. Uh, a second attack on a Sunni mosque in central Gore province. Dozens killed. 
the last Kurdish fighter's chase from Kirkuk province, capping a lightning quick land grab by pro Baghdad forces. EU leaders put on a brave face on deadlocked Brexit talks as they uh, wrap up a uh, European summit in Brussels. France's president warns the 27 are a long way from agreeing with Theresa May on terms of divorce. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Foreign editor Christopher Dickey is with us. Welcome back as well to Claude Guibal, senior correspondent at uh, French public radio station France Inter. Claire Byrne of the French news agency AFP. Uh, welcome back to you as well. And uh, uh, Pierre Aski, uh, president of Reporters Without Borders, who uh, in a previous life was a Beijing correspondent. Yes, <laughs> I see you're coming. <laughs> okay, 36 times. Uh, that's how many times Xi Jinping used the expression new era in his opening speech before the 19th Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, a Congress to further consolidate the country's most powerful leader in decades, one who may even snub the custom of anointing a successor during the Congress. This new era will be an era of building on past successes to further advance our cause and of continuing in a new historical context to strive for the success of socialism with Chinese characteristics. So, first of all, what is socialism with Chinese characteristics? What does he mean by it? It, th that's a phrase that's been used for the past 30 years because that means we're uh, introducing capitalism in 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 the Maoist structure and so we but has the meaning so, changed so so has we are calling we're, so we're calling it socialism it. with chinese characteristic it's it's just yeah, words it's uh, the the novlong as as uh, uh, people say uh, what it means in this case is that uh, Xi Jinping is bringing new theoretical uh, layers to the already existing um, ideological foundations of the Communist Party. And it's probably going to be introduced in the Constitution, uh, which will make him at the same level as Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, uh, which is uh, um, the, you know, the only purpose of this Congress is to bring Xi Jinping at that level above every single leader that has preceded him in the past 25 years. And the fact, and that's still a question mark because the Congress is closing only next Wednesday, but the question whether uh, his successor will be appointed is, is a key question because in, in the past 20 years, uh, um, presidents were running for two mandates. And at the end of the first mandate, you knew who was going to succeed them five years later. Uh, this time it seems that the next uh, permanent committee of the Politburo, sorry for the, the very bureaucratic structure, but that's the, the governing body of, the, of China, uh, will not include someone who will appear uh, obviously to be uh, yeah. Xi Jinping's successor, which gives him obviously an, uh, an incredible power. And it makes him, as the economist said, the most powerful man in the world today, because you have a dysfunctional United States, you have a Europe that still doesn't know whether it, it is in the process of reviving. You have Putin, who is powerful, but has a, a, a lot of weaknesses in his country. And here you have a man who has all the power uh, over, uh, over 1.4 billion people. And the world's a second largest economy. Sec second economy, mm -hmm. uh, a, a growing army, and, and growing assertiveness uh, in the world. And, and that is uh, definitely what came out of that speech. That speech was three hours and 30 minutes long. Fidel Castro is dead, but Xi Jinping is very well alive. Three, 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 three and a half hours. Uh, is he, well, flying too close to the sun? Uh, hmm. With, uh, you know, you have a cult of personality always, I suppose. But uh, in this particular case, because you, you mentioned bureaucracy there. There's two bureaucracies, right, in China. There's the Chinese Communist Party and there's the, and the state States. apparatus. Yeah. Is he going to make a lot of enemies by uh, making himself too powerful? If I was Xi Jinping's enemy, I would be uh, hiding for cover at the moment because 
uh, this man has, has shown uh, how he handles enemies. And the last one was the leader of Chongqing. Chongqing is a very important city. Uh, and, and the party secretary of Chongqing, which is 30 million people in the center of China, was dismissed only a few months ago. And uh, and is now under investigation for corruption, and uh, and so and he was belonging to a different clan from Xi Jinping. So uh, I don't think uh, he has too much to worry uh, at this stage, as long as he can deliver, and he can deliver at the moment, both economically. China is still growing in a, on a slower pace than 6. before, percent. but still growing. And, and, and it is um, uh, asserting itself more and more powerfully on, on the world stage. Uh, uh, Donald Trump is coming to China in two weeks' time. Uh, that's going to be a very interesting moment to, to witness, because you're going to have on one side the leader of the number one superpower, but who who, uh, who is not credible anymore in, on the world stage. And on the other side, you have the newly reconducted leader of the second power, but who is still growing in, 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 uh, in his uh, uh, yeah, power. Yeah, and, and, and under Donald Trump's predecessor, uh, those meetings were dubbed the G2, and there was always criticism saying Barack Obama was being played by Xi Jinping. How's it going to go this time? Well, I think that Pierre put his finger on it. I think that right, Barack Obama had some international credibility as the head of a superpower. People don't know what the hell uh, Trump is thinking. And frankly, Trump's big concern is going to be something that we haven't mentioned. It's going to be North Korea. Uh, it's mm. going to be the Korean nuclear race. Uh, what's going on with that? What will China do? Uh, and that is also a thorn in the side for Xi Jinping, because it's not clear he can really control what's going on in North Korea. And if he can control it, why isn't he doing more? So I think that's going to be a big, big concern for Trump. Even if there are lots of other issues discussed, that's where he has to bring something back to America. And the $370 billion trade deficit. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, talking trade deficits just doesn't ring as dramatic to most people as bombs, as nuclear bombs landing on Washington, D.C. or New York City, which is what people are concerned about. <laughs> Claude Guibal, your thoughts on China having, at the time when its economy is at its apex, uh, this one-man rule almost. I'm, I know I'm exaggerating, but close to it. I think it's quite fascinating, this new Mao, or this need, but it's not only in China, it's this need for strong men everywhere. I mean, maybe because of the disruptive times we are uh, experiencing, there is this need and there is a huge vacuum to be filled for that, you know, um, in, and see what's going on in Turkey, see what's going on in, in, in Russia, see what's going on in Hungary, in Hungary China, wherever. Poland. A, a world that's more and more interconnected, and yet it, uh, yes. this thirst for, for strong men or strong leaders. And he, he recognized that in his speech to the Congress, and he was saying that uh, Chinese and uh, China's socialism with Chinese characteristics, mm -hmm. you know, could be a model for the world, could yeah. be a th sort of a third way between uh, sort of... Um, uh, dictatorship and uh, democracy. Um, and I was kind of wondering who he was who he had in mind when he was positing this model and maybe Africa, maybe African countries, you know, might find something to like in that countries where the Liberation Party is still in power and you've got de facto one party rule, um, might look to China, its strong growth rate, you know, s somewhat repressive but, and find a lot to like. Uh, but the, ten the, the tentacles of the, uh, uh, of the Chinese state growing in the economy and many wondering if um, there is a limit to how much China can grow, whether it does have feet of clay, especially because he talked about innovation, dare to innovate. But can you dare to innovate if the state is, is peering over your shoulder? Look, China today is one of the most innovative countries in the world. You know, they are ahead of the U.S. and Europe in, in, uh, in uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and, and you should not uh, dismiss that. And, and they are countering every theory that we had about China, that a repressive state cannot innovate, that internet will bring freedom, uh, that market economy will bring democracy, all that has collapsed in China because it's a, it's a 
continent state, you know, it's 1.4 billion people. Uh, and, and it has a strategy which no one else has. You know, they're, they're thinking ahead in, in 30 years and they have the money to back it up. You know, when they're doing these new silk roads, you know, building highways, being, building uh, high speed trains across Central Asia, they're doing it. That's, that's where uh, it, it means something. Even to, you go to Greece, uh, China is one of the most influential countries in Greece at, the, at this stage mm. uh, because they bought the, the, the port the of uh, Piraea. Uh, they are investors. There was a, a big forum last week with Chinese investors in Athens. Uh, th th this is something that uh, you know, we've, we've always uh, maybe hoped uh, in the West that uh, all these limitations to China's powers would come from within. And, and for the moment, all we see is that they've overcome all these limitations. Uh, it, it might not last forever, but at least at this stage, it works. <laughs> it was the week, by the way, where the Panama Papers led to the formal indictment of a fallen prime minister. Pakistan's ousted leader Nawaz Sharif and his daughter could face jail time over London real estate dealings uncovered. He denies and hints the military may have a hand in it. It was also the week where the journalist working on the Panama Papers in Malta got killed. Two car bombs, including one under the driver's seat, used to assassinate 53-year-old Daphne Caruana Galizia in the EU's smallest member state. The journalist and blogger had both friends and plenty of foes. She wanted to root out whatever she thought was wrong, and she, she was driven by that, not by seeking the limelight. First, when she was a columnist for uh, local papers, uh, she used to attack policies, she was to attack um, labor for what it stood for and for uh, for our she used to attack our policies when we went when when and she shifted online she went uh, not just because uh, not just attacking our policies but she used to go um, into the gossip and she, she became also a gossip columnist and gossip sells. So she was uh, widely read. He's a member of the ruling Labour Party, yeah, which is often I would a never target. Guessed. I mean, you know, <laughs> but in fact, we don't think we don't know why she was killed. We don't know who killed her. But we know that she was investigating a lot of stuff that was not gossip at all. And part of what she was investigating, for instance, was a whole traffic in oil, illegal oil from Libya into Italy. It was going, being trafficked by the mafia, by Libyan militias. Uh, these are the kind of people who do blow you up. These are the kind of people who do kill you. Do we really think that these uh, rather tawdry Maltese politicians would go to the trouble or even have the capacity to blow her up as she was driving away from her home in a rental car that she'd rented the day before? No, I don't think so. And that particular hit was a classic hit by somebody who really knew what they were doing, whether a mafia or an intelligence service, uh, because they waited until she had pulled away from anybody else and then probably detonated the bomb, two bombs, by remote control. One that blew up the car and one that was directly under her seat that went off afterwards in case she had survived the first blast. So it was a professional hit. I don't think there's anybody that professional in the Maltese government. Ha on the hashtag world this week, until someone or persons are convicted over the murder of Daphne Galizia, then this will always be a stain on the soul of the Maltese nation. Your thoughts on that, Claire Byrne? Well, it just feels extraordinary that a journalist could be, could be murdered in the EU. Um, I, I get, it's surely been a long time since we've had a case like that. Um, in my own country, Ireland, we did have a, a famous oh. case in 1996. Uh, Veronica case, Guerin. Veronica Guerin, uh, who was investigating drug barons uh, who was um, shot in her car and in a case that really uh, uh, led to change, legislative change uh, in terms of investigating uh, drug syndicates, uh, confiscating their assets, etc. Um, so uh, it would be good if this death weren't in vain and also led to some form of uh, stock taking on uh, organised crime. Mm -hmm. Pierre you know, Reporters Without Borders uh, was going to announce in a few days a new program called Freedom Voices, which is setting up a team of investigative journalists who are ready to take over 
investigations when the reporter who was in charge is incapacitated, whether he's jailed or killed. And to be honest, we were thinking of uh, investigations in Kazakhstan or, or in, in Mexico, uh, not within the EU. And, and um, so we're having a look at the moment whether this should be the first uh, case that this new team uh, will try to pursue so that she didn't die uh, and close uh, every hope of knowing what she was working on. Uh, we need to show that you can maybe jail or kill a reporter, but the work they were doing is continuing. And this program, uh, if the investigation goes on, then it's going to be distributed freely within all the network of the, uh, there's a the consortium of investigative journalists that have been created, uh, having newspapers from some 40 countries involved, and this will be distributed freely among this, uh, this network. All right, before we go, a week, and we'll of course be, be following that, a week ago at this time, uh, Christopher Dickey here present was predicting uh, that the Harvey Weinstein scandal uh, would not be going away anytime soon. Uh, you were indeed right about that. Uh, it's about much more than salacious tales of lewd behavior on Hollywood casting couches, though. Here in France, the balance ton peur hashtag, rat out a pig, going viral, the way the Me Too hashtag went viral in the United States and elsewhere. And again, it goes way beyond Harvey Weinstein. France's president uh, has uh, reacted. So has the first lady. Um, and these, this hashtag has prompted uh, questions. There's been revelations about other people, uh, Claude Guibard, not just, of course, in the film industry, but politicians, business leaders uh, from Medias. other walks of life and, and for years. Is this a turning point, the way we asked if it was a turning point after the strauss kahn affair in 2011? I, know, no, I don't know. There may be a before and an after, but really what surprised me the most is, like... Um, it seems that a veil, something has been unveiled suddenly, you know, that uh, any, any single woman I know has experienced this kind of thing. Every single woman has experienced something like that. And thanks to this um, uh, Ave Winston's affair, you know, now people are just reacting. We are thinking about new laws. Uh, but there is also this problem with, uh, you know, like exposing, naming and shaming people on Twitter, you know, because Twitter is not a, uh, it's not a courtroom, you know. Yeah, and and on, on the and Twitter more... thread, very few people are naming, I've seen. They're mostly relaying their experiences. N not, they're not naming a lot, but they are naming more and more. And a lot of people may not sleep very well tonight and the next days, you know, and the coming days, because to, this morning we had uh, former ministers being, you know, mm. uh, being involved. And also uh, you said you yes, told there me... Yes, there were two cases today uh, that were revealed. One uh, against a, a former min senior minister of, uh, under Mitterrand. Under Mitterrand. And, and the other one is uh, a woman who's accusing Tariq Ramadan who is the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, is the, the, the grandson of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, and he's being accused by a French Muslim uh, activist of having uh, been assaulted by him in but, Paris. But lawyers say if you don't file a case, if you don't put something down at the police station, well, then it's just he said, she said. And we've heard denials from yes. that former minister, most notably, saying, oh, this is just a, a, a bad joke. That's right. And I think out of the tens of thousands of posts there have been in France, you know, we may, well, uh, there may only be a couple of cases. That said, um, rape hotlines in France have reported um, a spike in calls in the last couple of days from women making complaints. So there does seem to be some momentum there. Um, um, but for the moment, I think it's been mainly a kind of cathartic experience in a country that uh, has to be said, uh, has been seen as being soft on sexual harassment. Um, not just a stress kind of fair. Um, I remember it's only five years ago that in the French National Assembly, a minister was wolf whistled uh, when she arrived in a dress. Um, so, I mean, uh, France still has a, a mile to go. Things had improved. 
must do more. And I think that there has been an enormous release with this campaign. And I'm not sure it will all go away. I think something has been, um, something has bolted and won't be, can't be put back in its box now in France. A lot of the onus being put on not just the men, obviously, who are predators, but men being encouraged to speak out. Over the past 24 hours, we've heard the film director, Quentin Tarantino, come forward and say, look, I knew about Harvey Weinstein's behavior, and I deeply regret not having spoken out earlier. Your thoughts on that? Well, I think we always hear that sort of thing. We heard it with Strauss Kahn, too, mm. uh, six years ago now. Strauss Kahn, every, how many people came out and said, oh, oh, we knew about this with Strauss Kahn? Mm. He even talked to reporters off the record when he was looking like he was going to be a presidential candidate and saying, well, this problem with women might be, a, might be an issue for me. You know, so these kinds of things, I, I'm worried about this as a, a kind of Twitter catharsis mm. that comes and then goes. If there are not legal proceedings against a lot of people, that bear some penalty for those people, I think this will just pass again. I mean, maybe people will be a little toned down, a little intimidated. So I think it's interesting. It's not just he, shed, he said, she said either, at least not in the United States. Uh, for instance, Harvey Weinstein is in big trouble in Los Angeles now because a woman has come forward to the police, not to the press, and said that she was actually raped by him in 2013. Uh, which is within the statute of limitations, and that she told people at the time what had happened. That's what the police look for. Did, did you go to somebody? Did you have people that you talked to? Where you described the event? Did you describe it the same? Uh, is, that a, is that story consistent? That's what the special victims units go after. And that's what they're going to go after with Harvey Weinstein and, on the basis of that woman's testimony. And there's going to need to be a lot more training. We had uh, one panelist earlier this week who told us she went to the police and they asked her, what were you wearing? Mm. These kind of questions that in insinuate that somehow perhaps she encouraged it. It's, there's still a long way to go here in France, at least. There's still a long way to go as long as when you're a woman in France or maybe elsewhere, you have always to be aware that you are a woman. I'm, I'm not sure that men have to think all the time that they are men, that they are actually at risk of something because they are men. Women are, women are the way you dress, the way you, you, the way you behave. Uh, and you know that your, um, your words won't be taken for granted if you go and complain. All right, we're going to leave it there for now. Claude Guibel, I want to thank you. I want to thank as well Pierre Aski, Christopher Dickey, Claire Burns. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to Dipti Caron. Hi, François. So, yeah, we're, we're talking about the, the effects here in France. We didn't mention it, but there is even talk of penalizing cat calls. But I don't know how that, if that will be effective or not. But uh, certainly that's what the president suggested. Uh, well, that's part of the, the new uh, uh, bill that will be discussed next week, uh, next year on um, combating sexual harassment, sexual abuse in France. Now, we know that the uh, ballon stampot, that hashtag, uh, went viral this week. And for good reason, because the French version of Huffington Post reports that under a new survey, 53% uh, uh, of French women say they've already been victims of harassment and sexual assault, and that actually goes up to 63%, so uh, nearly one, in, uh, nearly two in three women under 35 who say they've been victims of sexual harassment and abuse, and perhaps in light of the Harvey Weinstein scandal uh, the, and its ripple effect, 91% of French people say, men and women say now, that the issue of sexual abuse is, a, is on a national level. It's an important national issue that needs to be addressed. But as the panelists were asking, uh, is that going to last, that 91 percent who thinks it's important, or is it as just as, as Claire was saying, a moment of catharsis? Well, it's really interesting because uh, there's an article from the website The Verge that looks at uh, the issue of uh, how this story broke. So basically the, uh, the article says, okay, the story broke through th traditional media like the New York Times, but the reason it's had legs is because of that Twitter movement, because it's been at the forefront in keeping the story relevant and giving at least a platform to women to express their anger because they, there's a lot of anger if you read all these tweets under Me Too, if you read these tweets under Balance Don't Pas, the one thing that really gets you is they're angry and this is a way for them to unleash their anger after so many years of silence. And of course that's the big difference between today and 
uh, when the Dominique Strauss-Kahn affair broke in this country, which is Twitter wasn't a force back then, and it does make a difference. Well, it does make a difference because it's also, as we said, uh, a danger, you know, if you use Twitter for um, abusive um, actions, you know, in the labeling and, and defaming someone. But um, st still, w with, the, with this, um, all these testimonies on Twitter, a lot of women know that their own experience is... Um, is, is so shared. It's, so, so, it's shared by so many, so many, so many persons, and I also think it's a problem. I have a, a almost teenage daughter, and she was telling me, "Mom, is that true? It happens to everybody. Mm. Uh, does that mean it happened to you? And does that mean it will happen to me?" And that's absolutely disheartening. It's heartbreaking because kids and friends assume the fact that it will happen to them one day. What did you answer? I, I told her, yeah, it happened to me. So that's how I should have reacted. And then that's how you should react if something like that happens. Diptika, you're following another story uh, for us this Friday, which has to do with discrimination at Oxbridge, at Oxford and Cambridge. Mm. That's right. Uh, this, this story has really been making the rounds on, on the internet today because it's a phenomenon so prevalent that some, uh, at least The Guardian, are calling it social apartheid. According to data, 10 out of 32 Oxford colleges didn't award a spot to a black student in 2015. Uh, one college offered one spot to a black student in the last six years. And similar data by Cambridge shows that six colleges didn't admit a black student in 2015. So many people saying, are they... Is there institutionalized racism uh, in the elite colleges of the UK? And on Twitter, people have been tweeting. This person says, uh, well, obviously, uh, this person on the side against the universities. If your mm. house has more widescreen TVs and books, don't plan on getting <laughs> to Oxford or Cambridge. <laughs> Which is quite oh. racist. <laughs> oh. <laughs> quite biting. But this yeah. this is from an interesting uh, user. He he says he was the first black student union president and says it had issues but was not institutionally racist. And just finally, this Twitter really this tweet really raises the issue of uh, you know does this mean we have to move in the direction of positive discrimination, which is itself very mm. controversial. All right, many thanks for that, Deep Tika Laurent. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the world this week.